Welcome to Christ Chapel College, the college outreach of Christ Chapel Bible Church in Fort Worth, Texas. We hope everyone experiences what Jesus calls abundant life. So we unapologetically point to Him as the source of life and joy. If you're a college student in the Fort Worth area, we'd be stoked to connect with you. Find out more at ChristChapelCollege.org and on Instagram at Christ Chapel College. Hey, how are y'all? Good. Missed you guys. Uh, I hope you had a good spring break uh, two weeks ago. I uh, hope for some of you, I'm, I'm sure it was sweet and good, and uh, hopefully it was restful, or you got to do something that felt meaningful or purposeful, or honestly, just rest is those things as well. Um, or Honestly, maybe this is true for a lot of my story. Um, there are times where man, maybe you had a really rough week. Maybe spring break wasn't good for you. Maybe there was family drama. Maybe there was uh, stuff that you were walking into. Maybe um, there were decisions you made that seemed like fun on the front end, on the back end, uh, felt discouraged. And so wherever you're at and whatever kind of that uh, place in your life is that you find yourself kind of post spring break, um, my hope is that Today's scriptures are really going to be an encouragement to you guys. Um, we're going to be in God's Word today. If you have a Bible, uh, you're going to need one of those or get an app or something like that. We'll put them up on the screen too. If you don't have a Bible or you made it back without one or anything like that, we've got Bibles we would love to give you. Honestly, we've got Bibles around this table. There's black ones. There's a really sweet family that's donated some like purple leather ones too. Um, so that's cool. So grab a Bible on your way out, man. That is our gift to you. Um, there's this concept right, in, in Scripture. It's really a calling that we have, uh, if you're a Christian, of really what it looks like to draw near to the Lord. This idea to grow close to Him is something that if, if we're a follower of Christ, if we're a Christian, then we are called to, to have that kind of a life, that we are growing closer to Him. And unique to every other religion, every other re world religion, what is unique about Christianity is we would say that that nearness isn't initiated by us working our way close to Him. Uh, that that nearness of God, that when he first draws near to us, that point of salvation for us, where all of a sudden he says, man, we've got a relationship now, um, is really initiated by him, his grace, and our faith in just saying yes to this gracious God. We don't earn it. We don't get close to him, and then one day we climb the ladder, and now all of a sudden we're one of his. Um, and, and one of the best ways I think we can talk about that is um, this idea of adoption. Right? There is this idea of adoption that's a biblical concept um, even. And so just picture that you were adopted by perfect parents, right? None of us have perfect parents or are no perfect parents. But picture you've been adopted by perfect parents and you were an orphan and didn't have anything. Well, that idea of adoption is salvation, right? That, that's the idea that God has come and he said, hey, you are my son. You are my daughter. There's nothing you can do to earn it. I love you. You're a crying infant who's pooping in their pants. I love you right where you're at. You bring nothing to the table, but I love you and I'm adopting you. And a perfect father then would say, okay, nothing is ever going to change that. Nothing is ever going to not make you be my son or be my daughter. However, although that would be the idea of salvation, there's this concept of sanctification in the Christian life, or really this concept of drawing near to him, right? A three-year-old, how he or she would interact with their father should mature and should deepen when they become an eight-year-old, or when they become a 16-year-old, or when they become a 25-year-old, or when it's a 40-year-old who's sitting with their father older, that that relationship should grow closer and closer and closer. And we are designed for that. We're called to that. And so what we're going to look at is this idea of, man, what does it look like to grow closer to God and some of the traps that happen from that? Um, not grow closer to be saved, but grow closer to know him more. And really, to be close to him is to experience what we believe abundant life. Right, that abundant life is actually found when we're closer. No joke, my life, my life is more satisfied when I am living a life that is more glorifying to God. Not because of some weird karma rule that if I do good things, God's gonna like give me happiness. No, but because of my design, because I believe we're designed to be connected to an eternal holy God. And when I am living a life that brings him glory and walking closely with him, I'm actually more satisfied. And you would think, well, I just stay always close to him. But the reality is my walk with him still is this roller coaster in my life of highs, right? Mountaintop experiences and lows that feel like valley experiences. Um, that's where we're going. Um, the thief in John 10, 10 
The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly, right? That's where this concept comes from. I want to grow close to the Lord. I want to, I want to be on that mountaintop with him so that I might experience the abundant life that he has designed for me to experience in a relationship with him. But recognize there is a thief. There's an enemy that wants to derail you guys, that wants to spiral you guys, that wants to kill, steal, destroy, and remove you from, from growing closer to God. Um, wants me stuck in my sin, a life that's void of meaning and honestly just in general gets me down for the count. <clears throat> I want to explore what the Bible has to say about this concept. That's where we're going. Um, coming off of spring break, I- I- even just wherever you've been, even in the last year of your life, some of you might really feel like today you are closer to a mountaintop. You feel closer to the Lord. Um, you feel like, man, I feel like the last year I've been growing a ton and I'm, I'm much closer to the Lord than I used to be. And some of you might feel the opposite. You might say, man, I'm much closer to the valley. I remember a day when I used to walk with him and that day seems so far away and so foggy now um, that I really feel like I'm just stuck in this valley spiritually and far from him. How do we navigate either spot? The Bible's gonna speak into that. The Bible's gonna speak into it and we're gonna see some warning steps for both being on the mountaintop or being in the valley. And so here we go. There's gonna be four stories we're gonna look at. Two stories addressing kind of our, our cautions and our next steps for being on a mountaintop and two stories for challenging us when we're stuck in a low in a low place. You're going to need a Bible. If you've got an iPhone Bible, that works too. That's also the Word of God. We'll throw the verses up on the screen. Hey, by the way, if you don't have a Bible, we would love to give you one. If you don't have one or you didn't make it to school with one or you didn't make it back from spring break with one or whatever, we've got them around the room. Just grab them. There's, there's some on these tables. There's black ones. I think we've got still got some purple like leather-bound ones too that someone donated. Grab one of those, man. That is yours uh, to keep. Or grab a few and then pawn a few of them and then just keep one of them, whatever you want to do there. All right, <clears throat> just kidding, that's a sin. Okay, here we go. Matthew 17 is where we're starting. Matthew 17 is this story called the Transfiguration. And so I'll throw it up there, Matthew 17. It's page 822 in my Bible, if that helps. Uh, you flip there, but Matthew 17. Jesus has been walking with his people, doing miracles, awesome stuff. And then this really, really cool, important thing happens up on a mountaintop. Verse one, and after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. Here's he's gonna explain what that means. And his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, It is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He was still speaking when behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them saying, rise, have no fear. But when they lifted their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And when they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell no one of this vision until the son of man is raised from the dead. Crazy, great story. The transfiguration of Jesus is when Jesus, historically 2,000 years ago, who walked this earth, right? He was God, we believe he was God with skin on. He was the incarnate person of God, right? Um, And and he showed up here on this mountain and he begins to these three of his closest disciples begins to reveal some of his glory, right? Pull back the curtain a little bit and he's glowing and shining. And then all of a sudden there's these uh, Old Testament, just saints, Moses and Elijah show up and they're like talking and it's this incredible experience. And the disciples, their minds are blown and and they're in awe completely. And then of course, Peter, Peter puts his, his foot in his mouth a ton. Peter's like, I know what we should do, guys. This is great that we're here. Thanks for inviting us. Uh, we should build three tents, three big tabernacles. We're gonna build them for all you guys. We'll get some supplies up here and we're gonna basically build three big, huge church sanctuary tent you know, things for you guys, and this is going to be incredible, and this is where we'll do it, and you guys deserve it, right? Um, Peter was mistaken, right? And I love how in every account, the same, the same transfiguration is documented in Matthew, Mark, and Luke by different authors, um, and in all three of those accounts, the author makes it clear that Peter gets interrupted. 
right here, you're like, while Peter was still talking, God is like, hey, 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 this is my son. This is who I'm well pleased. There's this anointing that is being reminded. Listen to him, right? Listen to him, authorize him. You wanna do all these things. You're talking up a storm. Be quiet, listen, this is, this is my son. Um, a mistake that they were making, that Peter was making, uh, when he's on this mountaintop experience is this idea that they wanted to set up camp on the mountain instead of continuing the work that Jesus had for them. And so in Peter's mind, he's thinking, okay, this is great. We're getting to see like the holiness of God and there's these saints. We're, this is an amazing experience. Let's just stay here. Let's stay here for as long as we can and stay on this mountain. And the six of us, you three guys, and you're like glorious robes glowing and us three in our cargo shorts, we're gonna live together on this mountain and it's gonna be great. That, that's his perspective, right? And there's this idea that um, God is saying, we're not doing that. Jesus, Jesus had a mission. Jesus had a calling. Jesus was walking this earth and he was, even from this point, he was on his way to the cross, not only did Jesus see that like his mission was not to just stay up on the mountain, his mission was to go down, it was to go down and suffer. Go down and ultimately be arrested and persecuted and executed by the Roman government for the sins of the world. Jesus knew that. And even as he's going down the mountain, he's admitting, hey, I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna be raised. But don't tell the story until after that happens. Which is, which is just crazy to think of that kind of obedience that Jesus had. I think it was really well intended. It was a very well intended mistake of Peter to be like, hey, this is awesome. The six of us, were all together. Let's just stay together in this huddle up here. Well intended, but misplaced. Jesus was on a mission. Jesus calls us to be on a mission. We make this mistake all the time. I make this mistake all the time. This, this mistake I make on the mountaintop that I ignore God's mission right? I so often ignore God's mission, and, and I get enamored with the good things that God gives, namely community, right? If we grow close to God, if you are walking with God in a biblical way that he's called you to, then you should find yourself walking in biblical community, right? Getting closer to God along with other brothers and sisters, right? We're designed for that. That's a part of how God uh, allows us to approach him and experience his graces is in community, right? Galatians 6 talks about this idea that we are called to carry each other's burdens. That's a part of his design. And so that's something that is a good, good thing, but so often that becomes the thing that I'm enamored with. I just want to stay in this good thing that God has done. Um, I, when I was in high school, I went and served with Wildlife, which Wildlife, although it's a confusing name, is a young life like ministry to middle school kids, right? And so middle school kids, and so I think I was a senior in high school, and I got recruited by my young life leader, and there's a couple guys from my school, and a couple of guys and girls from other schools too in the area, and so there was like six or seven of us, and we were leaders on this Wildlife trip with like 40 middle school kids, right? And so we get on the bus, and we're going to spend a whole week just being camp counselors and sharing Jesus with them and being encouraging and like, you know, all of those kind of good Christian camp counselor things. And so I had like given away my week to like really show and model and, and, and teach these middle school kids about Jesus. So we get on the bus and all of our leaders, there's six or seven of us, we all sit in the back of the bus, every one of us. And there's a couple of guys I knew and there's a lot I didn't even know. And so I'm getting to know them. And there's a couple of girls that are like, hey, these are godly girls who I don't know. I probably need to hear their story and like get to know them and make eye contact and talk about our feelings in the back of the bus, right? That's probably something I as a high school senior really need to prioritize. And so sure enough, like we're all just hanging out uh, as a bunch of high school seniors and then this bus full of 40 middle school students. And at some point, a couple of hours in, bus stops for a pit stop and our young life leader you know, we all get off the bus and he calls all of our leaders over this gas station. I remember, I still remember this. Um, and he calls us over and I, he was very kind and very compassionate. And, and I remember him asking, what are y'all doing? And he said lots of other things and he gave us a whole pep talk. And I don't remember anything else he said. I just remember being so convicted by this question of like, what am I doing? Like I'm here on this trip to like love these middle school kids. And I am just totally clicking it up with, with all of the other leaders. And I'm thankful that I'm going to have these leaders. I'm going to get to know them throughout the week. That's important. We're going to be like serving together and partnering together. But like I was, I was just missing the mission of what I had actually signed up for because the back of the bus with a bunch of other high school seniors, as I was, was way more comfortable than sitting with a bunch of 12-year-olds. 
So, so that happens to us all the time. We tend to huddle up. We get in these mountaintop experiences and we huddle up. Now, make no mistake. I need you to hear me say this. You are designed for Christian community. Right? If you are a believer, you are designed to be in Christian community. Right? You need insiders in your life. Right? You need an, an outlet to study this and to walk through what's happening here in your life and around your life with other believers to huddle up and get supported and carry each other's burdens. Make no mistake, you need that, right? It is dangerous if you are gonna go try to be on mission as a lone ranger, right? And just say, okay, I'm gonna be on mission and I don't have any kind of community. That's dangerous, right? And you might not be ready for that. There's certain parts of maybe places that you have a heart for that you're like, man, I wanna be light, in that dark place. I want to be what, what scripture says, salt in that place. And it could be that you're not ready for that. And you need to hear that wisdom and you need to set those boundaries. It could be that that's too close to some sin that you used to be stuck in. And you need to be really wise about how you protect yourself from that to say, hey, I, I might not be the person that can go down that road and reach those people because that is, that is a place I get stuck in really easy. And all of a sudden, I'm not going to be a light. I'm going to lose my witness. I'm not gonna be a, I'm not gonna be salt. I'm just gonna look like everyone else and I'm gonna get stuck back in what I used to struggle with, okay? And so hear me say that there's wisdom in this. You might not be ready to do that. You might need to just kind of be in community and grow. That's great and that's okay, but it's not okay to stay there for your entire Christian life. That's okay for certain parts of your life to say, man, I'm just growing right now and I'm learning how to walk and I need a lot of support around me, that is really, really okay and necessary. But if you look up in your Christian life and you just never left the huddle or you never took the huddle with you or you never invited an outsider into whatever sweet, cool, great, godly community you have, then we're missing something. We're missing the mission. We're missing the mission. Our lives as Christ followers, they should be inwardly fueled right, by, by a personal relationship with Christ, by private and personal time in God's word, and by Christian community carrying each other's burdens. They should be fueled by that, but they should also be outwardly facing the world that we're called to love, and so often in my life, and even being a pastor in ministry, I, that's hard for me, and it's so easy to just find my comfortable huddle. If you're on a mountaintop, great, if you find yourself right now where you're at, feeling close to the Lord, great Christian community, awesome. Invite other people into it. Invite someone else into it. Or take that community into places that, that need to, to see ambassadors for Christ, see the light of Christ in those places. Okay? Second one. Second one is this. Um, prodigal son is a story that we see in Luke 15. And so the prodigal son is not the guy who's doing it well. It's the guy who, who does it bad. Um, but I told you that this story was going to be for, for people who are doing it well. So stay tuned here. I'm going to paraphrase the prodigal son story. Um, if you've never heard it, it's an incredible story. It's one of my favorites. Usually when we, when we talk about Luke 15, we just talk about the first part of Luke 15, which is this son who basically said to his father, I wish you were dead. Um, I want my inheritance. You haven't died yet. I'm disappointed that you haven't died. So give me my half of your wealth and I'm gonna go live as if you're dead and totally abandon you. And so the father does that and is obviously grieved and the kid goes and he blows it, right? He blows it. He runs out of money. He lives this life of debauchery. It's empty. He ends up literally at a pig, at a pig trough and he's like, this is awful. And he comes to the realization just low of low, right? Talk about valleys. And he comes to this realization, the servants in my dad's house had it better than I have it now. So, I mean, their quarters and the meals that they ate, they at least lived a better life than I'm living now. So maybe I can go back to my dad and maybe he'll let me live as a servant in his house that at least is a better quality of life. So he gets up, he preps his, his apology speech. He starts walking back to the father. And in Luke 15, it says, while he was still a long way off, the father sees him and he runs off the porch and he hugs him and he embraces him and he takes his cloak off and he wraps it around him and the son's about to give his like apology speech that he's been rehearsing. He's like, dad, I'm sorry and I should have. And the dad like interrupts and doesn't even let him finish and he's like, you're my son. 
You're not a servant in my house. You're my son. You were dead and now you were found. I love you. We're going to throw a party of the century. Go find the best steaks. Go get the best cows. Slaughter them. Get all the servants. We are celebrating my son has returned to being my son living with me in my home. Beautiful picture of the gospel. Beautiful picture of how Jesus loves us, a bunch of prodigal, broken people, and how he loves us and how he calls us. That's actually not why Jesus tells the story, though. That's the setup for why Jesus tells that story. Why Jesus tells that story is actually Luke 15, verses 25 through 32, because he's telling this story to a bunch of guys who are prodigal. He's telling the story to a bunch of rule followers who are doing it right, who are living on the mountaintop, and they're just, the Christian game, they're just knocking out of the park. So then he says this. Listen to this, and we'll put it up on the screen for you too. Now his older son, so the prodigal son had an older brother. He was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked, what do these things mean? And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry. The brother, the older brother is angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you. I never disobeyed your command, yet you, you, yet you wouldn't even give me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and that and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. That is beautiful and heavy and so convicting. One of the other dangers, not just of having mountaintop spiritual experiences and, and being close to the Lord and being comfortable there, is also sometimes when we're walking closely with the Lord, to walk closely with the Lord is to walk righteously. It's to do the right thing out of, not to earn his love, but out of response of, oh my gosh, my father is so great. I want to obey him. I want to follow him. I want to live rightly and live these righteous lives that are glorified. That is inherent with walking close to him. And, and yet so often we make this mistake and the, the brother made this mistake, right? The mistake he made is he couldn't get over the unfairness of the father's grace. The brother was living a righteous life. He couldn't get a party thrown for him. He was living a righteous life. His, his younger brother literally took my father's wealth, spent it on prostitutes, and you're gonna throw a party and welcome him back? That was so unfair to the older brother. I kind of don't blame him. The gospel is, is pretty offensive in ways. The gospel is pretty powerful in ways. The gospel is pretty overwhelming in ways, especially, especially if I think I've earned my own righteousness. Here's the mistake we can make. The mistake we can make is we believe that we earned our grace and others need to do that too. Most people in here, if I said, hey man, are you like saved by grace and have you experienced the grace of God? Most people in here would all like nod their head. Yes, I understand it's the grace of God, but so often I don't know that we really fully grasp that it's fully by grace, right? We weren't partially dead in our sin, and then God, you know, partially, we, we resuscitated ourselves halfway, and then God finished off the job, or, or we worked ourselves up, you know, maybe 30% or 70%, and then God, you know, kind of took up the slack. We believe that we were fully dead, that we brought nothing to the table. And it's completely God's grace that allows us to be the sons and daughters that we are if we're in Christ. That is this beautiful idea, but so often we fall into this mistake when we're at the mountaintop, when we're walking righteously, which we should be doing, and we think, hey, I earned this. I earned this, man. This is me. This is my doing. I'm close to the Father because I worked my way up this mountain. And that is self-righteousness. And that's not true, and it's not biblical, and it's not from Scripture we see in, in Romans that no one is good, no, not one, that all have sinned. We see in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 that we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, the author of Ephesians, Paul says, not of works so that no one can boast. You didn't walk yourself up the mountain. God carried you up that mountain. So we have to be really careful that we aren't looking down on people saying, golly, where are they? 
And you guys, you guys have lived this. Some of you guys in this room have lived this, right? Some of you guys in this room have made decisions in college that I am so crazy, crazy proud of. You've said no to things and walked away from things and removed yourself from situations. You've missed out on certain things that the world would say are common college experiences and you were willing to miss out on those things because you said, man, I want something better. I want something that gives life and life abundant and doesn't leave me ultimately just discouraged and hungover and dissatisfied again. And that's awesome. And praise God. And that's not yay you. That's yay God in you, working through you. Philippians 2.13, for it's God who works in you to will and to do for his good pleasure. He's working in you to change those desires. That's awesome. But man, if you've ever been at a baptism, you know, one of our college baptisms, we've got one um, coming up soon you see somebody who's getting baptized and you might even think, that person, that, I know what she was doing two weekends ago. That guy, I know, I know where he was at. I know what his relationship with his girlfriend looks like. I know what, right, like we do that, we do that all the time and so when you're walking righteously, be really careful that you don't fall into this mistake of, of applying this condemnation that Christ didn't apply to you to people who say, I need grace and they need the same amount of grace as you do, as I do. Be careful for that. Okay, um, let me move on to now, maybe you've heard this first half of the sermon, you thought, okay, awesome, for walking close to the Lord. Maybe that's not your story right now. Maybe you're not in the place where it's like, man, I just feel like I'm so close to the Lord. Maybe you feel like, man, I am closer to the valley than the mountaintop right now, which um, I spent a lot of time in college, probably closer to the valley than the mountaintop. I want you to look at two things. First, I want you to look at the story of David. 2 Samuel chapter 11. I'm going to read it for us, and I'll throw it up on the screen too. But 2 Samuel chapter 11. David was a man after God's own heart. David was a stud. I mean, God selected him, anointed him. He was king of Israel. Uh, I mean, he wrote a bunch of scripture. He wrote most of the Psalms that we study. Godly man. Look at some mistakes. Look at some sin that David falls into. Pretty hardcore. Chapter 11. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Reba, but David remained in Jerusalem. So verse one, we get this context of David wasn't where he was supposed to be. He wasn't where kings were supposed to be with their, with their people, with their soldiers, with their armies. He sent them ahead, and he was not where he was supposed to be, which is important because that mistake, putting himself where he isn't supposed to be, turns into um, sin that begets more sin that begets more sin. <clears throat> Verse two. But it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, is that not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers to her and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she'd been purifying herself from her uncleanliness. Then she returned to her house and the woman conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So here we have a man after God's own heart, um, a man who has contributed significantly to the Old Testament, not just the, the history of the Old Testament, but even in the Old Testament um, what we read and study and, and sit with um, isn't where he's supposed to be, falls into sin, is tempted, buys into that temptation, sleeps, gets pregnant, another man's wife. He has an opportunity there to, to repent, to change, but he doesn't. He comes up with this great idea. You know what? This is really awkward. Instead of just turning from this and owning it, he's going to compound it. And so instead what he does is he has Uriah, the husband, come back from battle and say, hey, you've been working hard. Come back, stay with your wife for a week. You earned it, right? Thinking, good, now when she starts showing that she's pregnant, everyone will assume it was Uriah, not me. Thought he could kind of hide his sin. Well, Uriah is a good, good guy. And Uriah is a leader of a bunch of soldiers. And he says, I can't go in my house and lay in my bed with my soldiers literally sleeping on a, on a battlefield out there. That's not right for me as a commander of those men, so I'm gonna sleep outside my house. And David's like, great, this won't work. So David does this. In the morning, verse 14, in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, which is the commander, 
and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, sent Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. So David works out this plan to get Uriah killed. Ironically, he writes the note, seals it, gives it to Uriah. Uriah then goes back to the battle, hands it to his general. His general opens it and realizes, okay, this guy just handed me his own death sentence from King David, who's trying to cover up his sin. Uriah dies, is, is killed in battle. And then in verse 26, when the wife of Uriah, Bathsheba, who David got pregnant, heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, David set, sent and brought her to the house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. What we see here in this, uh, this is a great example of somebody who's obviously living in a valley, right? Far from the Lord, not walking with the Lord. And what's happening is their sin is then trying to be covered up by more sin. Here's the trap he fell into. He tried to use sin to cover more sin. Made a mistake, wasn't where he's supposed to be, made some sin, and instead of, instead of running from that sin, just said, okay, I'm just gonna cover that with more sin. Uh, that didn't work. Okay, now I'm gonna cover that with more sin, and more sin, and more sin. And eventually, just really destroyed David, and it was, had massive consequences in his life as a man of God that he was called to be. Um, I do that. Right? We do that. We spiral. And maybe our sin looks different than David's, but so often, we, we engage in sin. It's a trap that we fall into. Oh, our sin only produces more damage and numbness, right? Our sin only produces more damage and numbness. And so I might, I might do something and make a mistake and then feel the weight of that. And then instead of running to God for that, instead of running to God or community, Christian community to speak into that, to confess, to help me walk that out and draw nearer to God, what I do is I then say, God, that hurt. I'm going to numb that with more sin. I'm going to hide that. I'm going to shove that down. Man, that was a really crummy thing I did, and I don't, I don't like the way that it made me feel. So I'm gonna just, I'm gonna have some cope. I'm gonna cope with some stuff. I'm gonna, I'm gonna numb that. I'm gonna do some things that'll take my mind off of it. And man, we spiral. So often when we get low, we just start spiraling because we're layering sin on top of sin on top of sin. And we feel stuck. And then we feel buried by it. There's restoration for that. There's redemption from that. 2 Samuel chapter 12, the next chapter, verse 20, we see, I mean, all these horrible things happen and there's a, they lose the baby and there's just awful stuff and, and David just gets busted, right? He gets busted and, and they come out and everyone finds out his sin and I mean, it's literally written in the Bible um, so everyone knows oh, what, what King David did, this godly man. And he just grieves and, and really mourns what he did. And then in verse 20, he gets up and dusts himself off and goes to worship the Lord. Knowing he's not worthy to do it, but knowing that he's welcome to worship the Lord because of who God is. Because of God's graciousness. And letting God clean his heart. And letting God restore him. David in Psalm 51 he writes Psalm 51 and, and Psalm 51 is written around the time that David is wrestling with this particular sin and it's an incredible Psalm. If you ever grab my Bible and look through the Psalms, Psalm 51 in my Bible is all marked up and the pages are real worn because I spend a lot of time in Psalm 51 because I'm a sinner. I need to keep going back to the Lord and saying, God, would you restore me? Would you help me keep my eyes fixed on you? Psalm 51, there's a, there's a, it's a beautiful chapter. Y'all should spend some time in it. But there's three verses that I love that David is praying. And David's praying this. I want to encourage you, if you feel low, pray this. Go to the Lord with this. Verse 10, 11, and 12 in chapter 51, he says this. David says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. He's broken. He's dirty. God, but you can clean. You can restore. Cast me not away from your presence. I don't want to stop walking with you in fellowship. Take now your Holy Spirit for me. And then verse 12, I love. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. He's saying, man, my heart has grown so numb. Sin numbs us so much and we feel callous to it and we feel far from God. And he says, would you restore with all that numbness? I remember a day I used to be close to you and that seems so far away and all I could see is my mistakes. God, would you restore to me that joy 
what it used to be like when I was first saved, when you first showed up and adopted me and said, I am yours and I bring nothing to the table, but you fully love me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. That is a prayer of David. That is a prayer for everyone. That should be on everyone's lips. In the name of Jesus, when we get in those ruts, when we get low, God created me a clean heart. Through Christ, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Last story. Last story is Peter. Peter in the New Testament, in John chapter 18, um, Jesus had been arrested. Before he was arrested, Jesus prophesies. And he says, Peter, you're gonna deny me. And Peter's like, there's no way I'm gonna deny you. Jesus, you are, I mean, I'll chop people's ears off for you. Like, I am Peter, I love you, you're my boy. I saw you on the mountaintop. We're really, really tight. And he says, you're gonna deny me. You're gonna deny me three times before the crow even crow, before the, the rooster even crows in the morning. And Peter doesn't believe it. Sure enough, John chapter 18, uh, look what happens. I have to get there. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to read verse 15 through 18. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter stood outside of the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. So Jesus has been arrested. They're kind of hanging out. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Peter's kind of loitering to try to figure out what's going to happen to Jesus. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now they gathered this fire together and they, they get this fire to keep warm. Drop down to verse 25. So he's already denied him once to a little girl who said, wait, aren't you a follower of Jesus? He's like, nope, no way. I don't know Jesus at all. Then verse 25, now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They're all gathered around this fire. So they said to him, you also are not one of the disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off earlier, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once the rooster crowed. Um, that uh, has got to hurt, right? For Peter this man who was so close to Jesus, right? He was so close to Jesus. He knew he had experienced, he had been close to Christ. Uh, he had been literally on the mountaintop. Now is completely betraying, completely saying, I do not know Jesus. I don't have anything to do with Jesus. I'm not associated with him. I'm associated with him when it's convenient for me, but right now it's not. And so I am completely turning my back on Jesus. And what that did in Peter's life was it just, it, it buried him in shame, right? Look at this, the shame, the trap he fell into is the shame from betraying the God he used to work, walk with. And we even see a timidity with Peter until he gets, until we see John chapter one, we see this timidity of where's, where's Peter to be found? The shame from betraying the God he used to walk with. And I can't imagine, right? I can't imagine you walk so closely with Christ and then like that, you just turn and betray him. And then I realize, oh, I can totally imagine that. That's me. That is my life. My life is this life where God has redeemed me and saved me and loves me and drawn near to me and I've experienced the sweetness of God and yet I still choose other things over him in, in certain times. There's still times where I'm like, oh, this is good and this is convenient right now to be close to you but now I kind of want to do what I want to do and we do that and so the, the trap we fall into is we start believing the shame, right? And when we start to betray and kind of stiff arm God, we believe that our betrayal is just too much this time. And so when we betray him, when we turn our back, when we say, you know what, I want my way. Thanks, Jesus, that was great. This was a cool summer with you. This was a great experience. It was a great trip. Really had a great season in my life, whatever that means, however long that is. But now I just, I want to kind of do things my way. And we betray him, and then we think, oh, no. I stabbed him in the back. This, this time is too much. Shame is this powerful lie that can just keep us buried. It really is. Shame is, listen to me. Shame is not from the Lord. Shame is not from the Lord. Conviction is absolutely from the Lord. Conviction is a gift from God. Conviction is a gift of the Holy Spirit to me, but shame and conviction sound really different. They sound really different. Conviction sounds like, Ben, I love you, and I've called you to something better. Conviction sounds like, Ben, what are you doing? 
what are you doing? I've called you to live this way. I've given you my word. I've shown you how to live in a way that's glorifying to me and ultimately most satisfying for you. What are you doing? Shame looks like, oh, I can't believe you did that. Shame looks like that is who you are. You messed up. You're ruined. You're too far. You're spoiled. You'll never be made clean. Shame wants to identify us by our sin. This sin is who I am now. I'm just this, I'm this person. I struggle with this. I'm just this person. Whereas conviction says, this is not who you are. Come and walk in the freedom that I have already paid for you. There's a difference there. But man, if you're low, if you're low or you feel like you're far from God, that cycle of how shame keeps you low and pushes you lower is such a tool of that enemy that is seeking to kill, steal, and destroy. And yet, Restoration is completely available through a relationship with Christ Jesus. It's a churchy thing to say. But I believe it. Available in your life right now, today, that, that you can experience what it looks like to have restoration. You can walk out a relationship with Christ that you're designed for and experience restoration of shame and mistakes and feeling far from God. John 21, Jesus has risen He's met with a lot of disciples and he goes and he meets with these disciples and Peter on the shore. And Peter's there on the shore and they have breakfast together. And it's kind of this first real big interaction since Jesus has um, risen from the dead with Peter, who Jesus knows and Peter is wearing the shame. He knows, he knows he's betrayed Christ and this is the interaction they have in verse 15 through 17 of, of that chapter 21. When they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he knows, man, I've betrayed you three times. And Jesus is this sweet, standing on the beach with Peter, restoring him. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And he was grieved. And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And Jesus restores him. He restores him and he brings him in. And Peter said, nope, I don't know you. I don't know you. I don't know you. And Jesus when he rises, goes and meets him at breakfast and says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And he says, I love you. I love you. I love you. I do. You know I do. And he was restored because that's what our God does. And Christ ended up building his church around Peter. Peter became the, the head of the church in Acts. And Jesus said, I will not abandon you. Would we experience that kind of grace? Would you know that kind of grace, that powerful grace, no matter how far you wander, if you are his, if you are saved, if you've actually put your faith in Christ, then you're adopted. Stop being buried by shame. That's not what he has for you. I want to challenge you where you go from here is I want you to do three things. I want you to keep these in your mind. Really, this is application for a lot of passages, but really it's the idea of identify. Identify what tendency you you might fall in, right? Identify what tendency you might fall in. Identify what place uh, you might land and where you struggle, whether it's the highs or the lows. See those traps that we talked about and then repent from them, which means turn from them, right? Run from them. See the trap of being high on the mountain and where those traps can be, being low in the valley and run and repent and turn from those. And don't just turn from them. Repent and then believe what is true. Repent and believe oh yeah, it's not just that these things are bad, it's that this thing is good. And in order to believe, you gotta be in what is true. You gotta be here. You gotta be with people who are studying this. You gotta be listening to this. You gotta be reading God's word to say, Lord, what is true? How, what can I put my belief in? And then it looks incredible as God just shows you. Right, if you find yourself like the disciples with, with Jesus, just wanting to have mountaintop comfortability, all of a sudden, you don't just repent from that comfortability, you also start believing that being obedient to God's mission is better than being comfortable, right? Being obedient to God's mission is better than being comfortable. If, if you're like the older brother having grace, right, for, for other sinners, right, and you're, you have a hard time showing that grace, you start believing 
that you're fully, de- you are fully dependent on God's grace, right? And you're called to show the same to others. If you feel like you're like David, you're stuck in this pattern of sin that just creates more and more sin, believe that God can restore you, heal you. And if you're like Peter and you feel like you've just betrayed God one too many times, believe that God can still love you and want you even when you've spent so long betraying him. That's who our God is. Would we lean into him? Would we, would we find ourselves, whether we're close to the Lord or far from him, we're on a mountaintop or we're in a valley, being careful to navigate our life based on this truth, who he calls us to be and how he calls us to love the world around us. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you. Thank you for how you love us, God. You love us so well, so perfectly. Um, I don't know what that fully looks like, God. But I want to spend the rest of my life figuring it out. I want to spend the rest of my life digging in and leaning in to a father who has adopted me, who has called me into a relationship with him deeper and deeper and deeper. I want to spend the rest of my life experiencing how deep your love for broken people goes and how sweet the restoration of what is broken, to not stay broken, to not stay broken, but be restored and be redeemed and the things that used to to just be so tempting, God, would you just take that temptation out of us, Lord? Would you grow us? Would you mature us as the kids that you love, as the kids that you called? Help us believe in the name of Jesus. Amen.